Thoth Hermes podcast. Welcome to the world of the Western esoteric tradition. Hello, friends and listeners, and welcome to a new episode of the Thoth Hermes podcast. My name is Rudolf, and I am your host, talking to you from the outskirts of the lovely Austrian capital, Vienna. This is episode 20 of season 7 of the Thoth Hermes podcast, and today we are January 15, 2021. My guest on this episode is from the other side of the planet again, from Australia, from Sydney to be precise, or from the area of Sydney. She is professor at the University of Sydney, and of course you have already guessed who we welcome today, Professor Carol Cossack who has done extensive research on religious studies, on occultism, on modern religious movements, and so on. And she has a very interesting approach to those questions we are going to ask her today. Right, and for all of you who have found their way for the first time to the Thought Hermes podcast, that happens every week because, of course, certain guests attract new people because they followed the guest and suddenly here they are on the Thought Hermes podcast. Well, welcome to you if you're here for the first time and welcome back all of you who are regulars and newly regulars. Um, nice to hear from you uh, with your uh, with your messages that I get from time to time, also to see how you find this podcast. That's always very interesting for me to know. And um, well, thank you for all your comments. And please do send me your comments, your input, your ideas. I'm trying to respond to everyone. I'm not able to fulfill all your wishes, especially not immediately, but I do my best. And um, I hope you realize that. In any case, if you're not familiar yet, I give you the address of the website at thoughthermes.com, which is spelled T H O T H E R M E S dot com. There you can find all the episodes that you have missed so far and also re listen to them if you want. You can find all the show notes to them. And that's a lot of information by now that you can dig through. Also, you can. S- there use the possibilities to send me your feedback not only on facebook and twitter but there is a contact form there you can even send me a free voicemail please use that more often i hardly get any of your voicemails i'd really like to hear from you in the literal sense and well finally finally of course you can always send me an email info at thoughtshermes.com You know that many, many podcasts, most of them actually, and other ventures nowadays are financed by you, the audience. And this is also the case here, uh, at least partly on the Thought Hermes podcast. And so thanks to all of you who are patrons of this show, who are supporting this show by their weekly little donation. And well, I would really appreciate if some more of you would follow that track and go on the Patreon site or on the Thoth Hermes website, click on the respective button to support the Thoth Hermes podcast. You are with us with $1 per episode already. And even then you can limit your monthly support if you need to. So I know it's all hard times at the moment for everyone economically, but that's also true here for the podcast. So um, please, support the show we really happy if we would and that makes us sustainable on the long run thank you so much well all regulars know what's coming now because uh, of course there is always music which is part of this show we play also here today three 
Well, actually today it's five pieces of music, but well, they're all related. That's in three blocks. In two of those music bits, there's two pieces if you take it technically, but let's not be too technical. The music is by, and that is much more important, by uh, George Gurdjieff. Um, we have played Gurdjieff's music on this show before, so the regulars here know, well, of course, many of you know that Gurdjieff has also written music, which has then, as he was not a musician himself, and he was not able to write it down in the way that musicians needed to be performed. So he had help by professional musicians later on to write his compositions into the way that the pianists and the musicians needed it. And that's how it has come down to us. And well, today we will play music from a selection or a collection rather which is called The Struggle of the Magicians. Um, so I think that's a nice topic. And I must also say, Professor Kusak, Carol, Carol Kusak, when I asked her if she had a special music wish for this show, she said, well, why don't you play Gurdjieff's music? So good idea. So Gurdjieff is back as a composer. I th make me think we should once do a show on him, maybe with some specialist on himself so to hear more about him we have heard bits and pieces here and there in some interviews but not really a topic on Gordiev. so but for the moment it's his music here and it's from the collection called um, the struggle of the magicians the first excerpt that we hear here it's in fact two smaller pieces which together last a bit over five minutes so and those pieces are called meditation and prayer. So enjoy now George Gordiev's music and they are called The Struggle of the Musicians. The pieces are meditation and prayer. Enjoy.
Meditation and Prayer from the music by George Gurdjieff called The Struggle of the Magicians. And, um, well, I should say also, I told you that he was not a musician himself, uh, George Gurdjieff. Well, he was a composer, but he didn't actually, he was actually able to write that music down the way it's needed. And it was mostly, and also in the case of those pieces, Thomas the Hartmann, who did that for him. He was a pupil, well, a student of um, Gurdjieff's in the spiritual world, but he was himself also a composer. He was Russian and collaborator of George Gurdjieff, and so he, he set that music into playable settings. Let's put it that way. I hope nobody's going to kill me for saying it like that. Okay, well, now let's go and meet Carol Cossack. Carol, she agreed to do this interview. I was very happy because she's really a very, very important figure in the academia world about well, about religious movements, basically, but a lot about their relations to occultism, to paganism, also to the paranormal. There is a whole collection of books. Uh, I'm not going to cite them all here. With She has written articles or published a whole book or edited books. Um, Handbook for Contemporary Paganism, for example. She was part of or that famous book on religious movements in relation to occultism and um, the paranormal. Um, I am, to the contrary of what I'm doing, usually not going to read you an excerpt from one of those books here today, because as they are mostly academic writings, I would have to read a whole article, because otherwise that wouldn't make sense just to show you um, one or two paragraphs. So I omit that here today, makes this intro here a bit shorter. Some of you are quite happy about that. Anyway, <laughs> let's be honest now. True. By the way, because I have not mentioned that for quite some time, and as we are talking about introductions and etc., um, I uh, have always chapter marks in those podcasts. And if your podcast player is able to read chapter marks, and most of them are, by the way, now today, um, I uh, you can always jump from one marker to the other. So there's always a marker where the music parts start, where the interviews start, and the second part of the interview starts, and where my outro talk starts. So you can always jump there, just find out on your player, and it makes life, maybe for you as listener, a bit easier. Back to Carol Kazak. She is professor of religious studies at the University of Sydney, as I said. She initially trained as medievalist and her doctorate was published as Conversion Among the Germanic Peoples in a book. So she now teaches and researches primarily in contemporary religious trends, new religious movements, that's of course also including uh, occultism and other movements, and Western esotericism, with a focus on George Gurdjieff, by the way. So that's also why she has asked me to play that music here today. And um, she is uh, extremely open-minded, extremely interesting, and also a very funny person. And I really urge you, I urge you to go on the show notes because there is a funny cartoon that she posted on her on her Facebook page uh, a couple of months ago, and uh, which I reproduced there. And well, it's very funny as such. It tells you about her as well. Right, so without much further ado, let's go and meet Carol Cossack. Just before that, let me remind you that in the middle of the interview, um, after about 32 minutes or so, we are going to take our usual musical break. And of course, we'll be back with music by George Gurdjieff. So I hope to that you enjoy that just as much as the interview. And now let's go to the Sydney area and meet Carol Cossack. Here comes the interview. 
It's a great pleasure for me to welcome here today on the Thoughts Hermes podcast. Uh, well, another guest actually from Australia. We've had several guests from Australia lately. Uh, I don't believe in coincidences. I think there must be some reason for that. Uh, Australia is an interesting terrain lately for us here. And um, um, I'm happy to welcome Carol Kasak here today with us. And I will introduce you briefly, Carol, but I don't think it's really needed. Hello. very. Glad to have you here. Thank you very much, Rudolf. It's a pleasure. No, it's a pleasure. It's all mine. Um, Carol, for uh, a reason which I believe I know, but maybe I'm, I'm just making this up. Maybe I'm completely wrong. Um, is one of those academics in the field of uh, spirituality and history of religion, etc., and um, who is rather well known among practicing occultists. Um, uh, we all know that there still is, and we are going to talk about that, I believe, um, a little bit a gap between the academic world and the practitioner's world. But you're one of those who who um, is a lot read by people who are actually practicing and who is very much respected in that field. And I'm very glad that you're here. And Carol, maybe we should start there um um would you agree to what i'm saying and um well if you know and um if so what do you think is the reason for that i think it depends who you are talking to it's certainly true that some practitioner groups are happy with the kind of work that i do and they find it i think the most important thing is they find it useful um I don't think it's um, particularly practitioner oriented. I'm I'm not in that space myself. Yeah. But I might point out that there are practitioners in other groups who are not very fond of me at all. So part of it depends on what you think esotericism is, because. I've spent a lot of my life working across many different fields of religion, spirituality, and esotericism. And I think perhaps sometimes the reason that I've worked across so many has been to be able to demonstrate to groups that I'm not a joiner, I don't wish to convert, that if I did want a path I was seeking somehow to achieve enlightenment that I would be hard pressed because I'd have like 15 different <laughs> groups who would all be offering me their particular way. And I've often thought of this as a kind of scholarly promiscuity. No, I can't marry you because I've got all these other people that I'm mm -hmm. interested in and I work with and about. So, for example, uh, a group like the Church of Scientology, which not everybody would agree was an esoteric religion, but I think mm -hmm. there's certainly um, a groundswell of research, particularly research I think that um, – Hugh Urban has done that would suggest mm -hmm. that that is one way you could classify Scientology. Um, they don't like me at all, and they're frequently reasonably unpleasant to me. Mm -hmm. um, for example, just in the last month or so, I've had to field two fairly um, angry criticisms from the church in Sydney, not over things that I have published as academic work, but over podcasts that I have been talking to. Really? <laughs> I dare say that if the Church of Scientology is trawling um, your podcast, I may get another complaint because they may say it is not fair of me to say that they have been unpleasant to me over the years. But you see... It's partly because, too, organisations can't be um, reduced to a single attitude or a single um, position. And it's mm -hmm. true that there have been people in Scientology in Sydney over the years who have been more friendly to academic work 
and there have yeah. been people who have been less friendly. Sure, sure. Well, now setting the Church of Scientology aside, um, I, I have no idea if somebody is listening. I think it's the first time ever on this show that it has been mentioned, even if I'm not now completely forgetting something. Um, but um, uh, I'm, of course, I, I don't know who is listening to this show. But uh, um, setting them apart, I think the the fact that some people or some groups even might agree with your work, others not, isn't that something inherent to esotericism and occultism in general, I mean, to many other fields as well, but especially in that very subjective field where many types of work, many outcomes are disputed, are, are very different from each other. Isn't that something that is very clearly inherent in that very field? Yes. I also think, however, that that's not particular to esotericism. It's inherent to any form of academic research as well. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if every single person in the world thinks that you are wonderful, you're probably not doing your job properly. <laughs> because <laughs> yes. It's easy to write kind of bland, general sort of stuff like, I, I, we are perhaps unkind. I know that sometimes very, very fine scholars write textbooks, but there is a sense in which the production of textbooks is generally seen as an inoffensive kind of work. And mm -hmm. I guess um, I've never really thought I wanted to do that sort of stuff, uh, so I don't. So, yes, you're correct. Um, obviously, some people will receive what I write positively and with interest, and others will reject it and they will say um, this silly woman from Australia isn't even a member of this group, so how on earth would she know what is going on inside it, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, yes, I see what you mean. And uh, But that is true even outside the academic world. I mean, you can, you can have people talking about whatever, the OGO, who have never been a member of it, and, uh, but they have a, a strong opinion because they, they are interested. They have, they have made up their minds, right? And they are attacked by those who are part of it because they don't agree. But you just used a word that I have a really um, – gut reaction to you use the word Good. opinion <laughs> yes i think it's really important to understand that what scholars do is not mm. opinion that is true um, yes as somebody who's taught undergraduates since 1984 um one of the first things i say to them all in first year is we're not interested in your opinions you may have them they are irrelevant we are interested in the kind of argument that you might be able to mount with reference to reliable evidence and how persuasive you might find that evidence. And I think that the idea that there are lots of people around who have opinions about esoteric groups, well, yes, everybody's got an opinion about religion, um, it's a very satisfying thing, I think, to the scholar to realize that almost everybody's opinion about religion is wrong. So, <laughs> But uh, you're making a really important and good point there. Of course, opinion is something else from, from results or from argument, as you, as you called it. Definitely, of course. Um, before we go to you, Carol Kozak, uh, to your person a little bit, um, let me ask you one last question about that relationship academia and and uh, esotericism um sometimes people say well how can you as opposed to for example catholic or other religious um uh, theologians as a, how can you talk about a thing and go deeply into that with your argument without being part of it you would not ask from a Catholic priest not to study theo Catholic theology, right? Um, but in the field of academia, this seems to be an opinion which is not 100% um, this, uh, everywhere, but I'd say 80%, 90%, that is the opinion. Why would you think it's so important in that very field? Okay. This is one of the arguments that is hugely important in the academic study of religion um, because it separates us from theologians. 
Yeah. Um, there is something of a problematic turf war between the academic, scholarly, non-confessional, secular study of religion and theology. And in the past, of course, in Western institutions, theology meant Christian theology, and sure. it, it presumed a conversation between believers, you know, people who were insiders. And, of course, that's also a problematic term because actually I think there's a lot of work that's been done recently to suggest that the distinctions between insiders and outsiders are nowhere near as simple as many people would like to um, make them. Hmm. So when religious studies started broadening, you know, and it included religions other than Christianity and so on and so forth, then there was this question about what happens with works about Hinduism by Hindus that are predominantly insider and faith focused. And I think correctly those defending the secular study of religion said that they were just a variant of theology, that theology wasn't restricted to Christians. Mm -hmm. Now, you probably know because the latest, well, latest, I suppose it's been going for about a decade, Stausch in this particular ideological conflict has been around especially new religious movement studies and pagan studies where so many scholars are themselves practitioners and sometimes they produce excellent um, secular study of religion works, but very often they produce a form of theology which is mm -hmm. an ap apologist position towards their own minority tradition. And, of course, this same question about insiders and crafting discourses for other insiders which cast an aspersion on secular scholars such as myself, for example, from the point of view of the practitioner always knows more, that's part of the academic study of esotericism as well, where many scholars are themselves allied with some organisation or other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I mean, maybe that brings us a bit too far away from, from our topic here, but that is maybe something that also happens in other branches of academia and um, natural science, for example, where people get too close to, to a group who has to pay for that study. And uh, therefore the results can be questioned. Are they still objective, etc.? And of course, in the field like religious studies, which are by nature more subjective, I would say, maybe I'm wrong, but um, by uh, that, that's even more a danger. See, I've argued all my life that it's not by nature more subjective. Okay. And um, a lot of people don't believe me, but I grew up in a country where even though we have surprising number of religious people in the government, actually the rates of religiosity amongst the general populace are pretty low. And I attended a secular university and I work in a secular university. There is no theology taught there. There is no connection with any established church. And when I was a young person, there were people, because our department was only actually founded in 1976. So it's 45 years old now. Hmm. And, um, I entered the university in 1981. It was only five years old. It was a young discipline. It's not really a discipline. It's more a field of studies with a whole mixture of different disciplines feeding into it. Mm -hmm. um, and I used to go to gatherings and academic board meetings and things like that. And older, more established disciplines, particularly, I think, history and philosophy frequently mounted public attacks about how there should be no study of religion in a secular university. And it used okay. to fall 
call on me and my colleagues who were much more senior than me, we would have to stand up and say, you, you mistake. You know, what we do is in fact pretty much exactly what you're doing in history or in anthropology or in philosophy because we are a polymethodic discipline. So I primarily am a historian, but as I've got more involved in contemporary work, I suppose I've taken on some aspects of being a sociologist and I was trained Mm -hmm. a little in those methods as an undergraduate. But in my department, there are people who are archaeologists and epigraphers. There are people who are ancient historians. There are people who are sociologists. There are people who are anthropologists. And we all don't see the fact that the word religion is there has anything to do. Like you could be, I could, I could work in a history department and do mm-hmm. pretty much everything that I have done. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it it's a speciality of that field in a way, right? Yeah. 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 So I yeah. think that the, the thing is you choose your methods. My methods are primarily history with a smattering of sociology And um, those methods are secular and are not allied with any particular religious, esoteric or spiritual position. And where I do them in the university, the fact that I go to a university, I work at a university where there is a named department of religion, that is very unusual in Australia. I think there are only three such departments. Mm. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, I'm very glad that we have you here on the podcast today because um, you're not the first uh, academician here on the podcast. We had Henrik Bogdan and Chris Judice, who will be returning, by the way, in a few months. But um, certainly uh, you are a, a very a head figure of religious studies within also this contact with esotericism. So I would be interested now that you have been talking about your department and when it started in Australia, about maybe a little bit of your personal story about that. How did you start to become interested in that field and um, what, what drove you into that field and to become such a deeply involved person in also the study of new religion, esotericism and the links? Well, I started off wanting to be a medievalist and I was a medievalist. Um, my Latin is rusty my Anglo-Saxon and Icelandic probably even worse these days. But when I was an undergraduate, they were reasonably good and I did a PhD on early medieval missions. So, um, you know, I was basically set up to work as a medievalist, but I did it all in a religious studies department and I think in some ways that was good. And then when I got a job, the year that my PhD was awarded, 1996. Um, I'd had a couple of half-time jobs before that and a bit of casual tutoring. Um, The staff in the department, you know, we had a meeting and I said, so what do I have to do? What is my work? And I was given three courses to teach and they were all on contemporary religion. And I said, "But, but I don't actually know anything about this. I'd done one unit on new religious movements when I was an undergraduate, one unit on sociology Mm -hmm. of religion, you know, a few small chunks. And they said, oh, don't worry, you know, you just have to keep a bit ahead of the students and by the time you finish teaching all of that, you'll know a fair amount about it. (laughs) And it took me, I suppose, about four or five years, so from 96 to 2000, before I thought, I would like actually to write and to work in this area rather than just to keep working as like a medievalist where I only get to teach that like every two years for one term or something like that. And so this is partly really a lot of it comes from people I knew. Um, I didn't think it was unusual at the time. Mm. I knew people from when I was an undergraduate who were, Discordians and Freemasons and 
Wiccans one or two, not a great number. I also knew a lot of people who joined new religious movements who were members of the Hare Krishnas or, you know, Sahaj Yoga. Um, when I was doing my honours year, which is a fourth year in Australia where you write a dissertation, which is actually quite like a, a coursework master's in most of Europe, um, mm-hmm. there were five of us who were students. One of them never finished. She got pregnant accidentally and went off to live in an ashram. She had been okay. loosely attached to some. Anyway, another guy, Hugh Molesworth, his grandparents had been very distinguished theosophists. And even though he was sort of on the, the fringes himself, he certainly was involved a lot. And he turned up, in, you know, his picture was in Theosophical magazines, you know, with his oh, yeah. friends who'd done this, that, and the other, et cetera. Um, Another student, Manuel, had also become some form of neo-Hindu. I can't remember what what organisation he joined. Um, And so, you know, I was kind of ordinary, uh, somebody who'd been brought up Catholic, but by that point, I'm just trying to work out, I was 22 maybe, Mm -hmm. um, having decided that I didn't really believe any of that and I didn't want it to be part of my life. Um, So I was probably the least spiritual person in my honours year. And um, so I knew loads of people. And then I had other friends. Mostly I had loads of friends who were IT specialists. And if you think back, in 1989, the World Wide Web graphics interface developed by Tim Berners-Lee was launched. Uh, I was 27 that year. And before that, basically all um, IT was really, computers were basically the the area of the specialist. You know, amateurs didn't understand yeah. them. Uh, and code. local, who, mostly local computers, basically. Yeah. That's exactly yeah. right. Though actually yeah. I knew guys who lived in basements in weird buildings on campus who played very primitive online games with people in Russia and Germany and all over the place, you know, when I was in my 20s. And they were very often um, connected. Like I met my first Crowleyites. They were all part of that IT subculture. Um, There was a period where I had a boyfriend in the early 90s after I got divorced um, who was kind of partially training in a kind of Salamic tradition, but was also a Discordian. He gave me my first Pope card. And, you know, it all seemed like it was just all sort of going around. And I used to collect stuff. So I often it would take me five years to decide to write something because I'd just collect things like magazine clippings and okay. print out emails and articles with, you know, three lines that I thought would be relevant and strange books that I picked up at secondhand shops. And so I started writing in new religious movements largely because I had folders full of this stuff in my office and also when my supervisor, Eric Sharp, who was a major religious studies scholar, retired in 1996, he's the reason that I actually got a job. Two of us were hired to replace him at much lower pay grades, of course. Um, he had a huge, he was like me, he'd kind of been a medievalist and he'd learned Sanskrit and done work on Hindus and missionaries. And then he'd collected this massive archive of new religious movement material. And so I worked a lot out of stuff that was just left in the filing cabinets in the office that I occupied because he'd left them there, you know. Right. That's fascinating. Fascinating story. I I must say that now because it just came to my mind when you said you were the least spiritual person. Um, You are one of the few people where I enjoy going on their Facebook page, actually. I'm I'm confessing this here now because normally, of course, I do use Facebook to be present with the podcast, but I don't post, basically. I just look and listen. But And uh, your page is really very funny and interesting at times. Uh, very funny and there was this on the 28th of November we posted that cartoon history of religion which I 
just would like uh, people to go and see. I might even, if I may take it on the website, just uh, accompanying our show notes. I find it so funny and telling, isn't it? Look, I thought that was, that was a great success. I love those sorts of things. Brilliant. That came yeah. from the Church of the Subgenius. Now, see... I'm, I'm not a subgenii, but they let me. In what there. is the? So, I was going to ask you, what is that? Church of the oh, okay, I've we'll never heard that. them. But, but I am actually a member of their closed Facebook group, even though I'm not a subgenii, because I've written right. a bunch of stuff about them. Okay. And um, they have a lot of hilarious posts, and you have to share them on your own page if you want anyone else to see them. Of so course. when I saw that cartoon, I thought, oh, this is fabulous. And so I posted it and I was very grateful and very happy that lots of academic religious studies people said, oh, I really love this. Hugh Urban, <laughs> who I mentioned earlier, said fewer magical people in the sky is the best definition of monotheism he's ever seen. <laughs> and I thought, yep, That's a good uh, yeah, so absolutely. But I like the conclusion. I don't want to say the last text <laughs> on the, let yep. people go and see them, uh, but it's, it's, it's really brilliant. Um, so back to our subject. Um, where, now, would you draw a line, if there is any, once again, I have to say that, draw the line between what we call religion and what we call esotericism or, well, I, maybe I should ask you about definitions first. What is occultism? What is esotericism in your point of view? Is there a difference? Where is the difference between the two? And then I can ask my question only. Okay. Uh, hmm? I like esotericism much better as a word than occultism. Mm -hmm. Because I was a medievalist by training, I know that more or less etymologically they kind of mean the same thing. Yeah, sure. Like occultism comes from the Latin, which gives you oculus for the eye, occluded for things that are dark or unclear. And esoteric is like something that happens within the inner room or the the inner group. Um, and so both of them indicate that this is not something that is public, open, um, available to all, um, you know, the opium of the people. Mm -hmm. They imply <laughs> that you must choose that you must train, that you must be serious and sincere and work towards, you know, essentially a goal mm. that is a form of enlightenment, I suppose. Um, I'm not sure that the distinctions are that helpful. Like I tend to like when you work, when you do writing, I tend to like just a working framework rather than saying, mm -hmm. right, this is exactly what religion mm -hmm. is and I know what it is and, you know, if it doesn't fit this, then it's not religion. I just think that's A, stupid, and B, greater minds than mine have spent most of their lives trying to figure out what religion is and mm -hmm. I don't pretend to think that I have some unique, astounding insight that's better. So mm -hmm. my problem with esotericism these days is that I think that it's a lot harder to have genuinely secret, hidden, inner kinds of practices and that a lot of groups in their kind of self-understanding have accepted that um, and become more open. And so I would say that quite a lot of groups where I feel welcomed and I feel like sometimes I get people writing to me and saying, you know, you're just wrong on this point or I'm not quite sure why you wrote that article because I don't really see that it's that interesting. And I might say, well, I can see from the point of view of somebody within like a practitioner lineage writing something about whether or not your group could constitute an intentional community or whether, you know, it, it operates under. 
I can see that it's not important for you, but actually it's something that people like me and my confederates are interested in. So, you know, I did it because I saw an idea and I thought, oh, yeah, I, I can do something here. Mm-hmm. And so the, the most detailed sort of uh, criticism or communication that I get probably are now from people within various Gurdjieff lineage, lineages because I do a lot of work in that area. I saw that, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's really interesting because for every person who's told me to piss off because I don't know what I'm talking about, <laughs> there's been another person who said, no, look, you're onto something there. You maybe don't have the whole picture, but, you know, there's some really interesting stuff in a notebook that somebody or others got a scan of and I might be able to arrange for you to get a look at it and then you be, might be able to see that you could take your argument further and I think, oh, Yay, you know, this is good. Because with a lot of groups, you start with the books, you start with whatever's public. And then, I mean, my relationship with Gurdjieff and the Gurdjieff tradition, if I go back in my life, it goes back to 1979 when I was 17 years yeah. old and I went mm-hmm. on a date with a very nice young man who is now a very nice old man that I'm still friendly with. And we went to see meetings with remarkable men, you know. And mm. I, it's not what I would advise as a date movie if you want to take um, a girl out. It's a very slow movie and it's very obscure and a lot of people think that as far as films go, it's really quite a failure. But it's really interesting because it's actually a film that's like a sort of mythologized autobiography of an esoteric leader, and there aren't many of them around. And in 1979, there were even fewer. So after that, I started collecting the books because, you know, there was this film, and then I discovered that there were books. And then I met people, which came quite some years later. Thank you, Carol. We'll be back in a few minutes with the second part of that really interesting talk and interview that I was able to have with Professor Carol Kazak from University of Sydney. And But let's just call her Carol. She is a really charming lady. Now, um, we come back to the music of George Gurdjieff, um, revised by Thomas de Hartmann. And we are going to play, well, two other pieces from the struggle of the magicians um, those pieces have no particular names at least i don't know them they are basically called number four and number two in that order they fit well in that order by the way the whole recordings were made at a concert uh, concert which was uh, which happened in 2020 and uh, was recorded in the jury of gurdjieff um, organization um, in california and uh, you can find more of those recordings, I believe, on their website. And uh, I will post also the link to that on my show notes. Um, uh, it was recorded, to be precise, on September 13, the Foundation of California. It's called the Gurdjieff Foundation of California. And Charles Ketchum is the pianist. So we now hear pieces four and two from The Struggle of the Magicians. Then we return to Carol Cossack, and at the end of the interview, we will end with number one and number six from The Struggle of the Magicians, after which, of course, I'll also tell you a bit about next week's episode. Okay, The Struggle of the Magicians, number four and number two.
I'm trying to to put that question now right because from how you uh, how you're telling that story not only what you say but how you're telling the story about Gurdjieff I feel some really genuine particular interest in that type of religious study that you must have because you I mean you could say I go for the traditional research on Hinduism or on Buddhism or on Catholicism or so but you you are much more looking for those um, smaller things maybe small but the ones that are more particular more uh, undisclosed so to speak why is that what what triggers that in you Um, look, when I was young, you had to learn about all the big ones. It was Mm. how it was. I'm 60 next year. And so I went through university and what you studied when you did religious studies was a unit on Japanese Buddhism and a unit on Hinduism and a unit on, you know, church history. And, and you know, at the time I didn't think about it as being particularly uninteresting. And I'm sure if you've spoken to some major pagan scholars, the one that springs to mind always for me is Graham Harvey. He has a PhD on Old Testament studies. He has flawless Hebrew and he had to, you know, we're, we're old. You couldn't do this sort of thing when we were students. It right. was not possible. Right. So We are the same generation, so I know what we're talking about. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, we, so, you know, a lot of us who like fringe things came out of a pretty mainstream undergraduate education and a PhD in an area that was considered approved at the time. And so it's really only for me having a job and becoming sort of established enough not to have to worry too much about explaining to people why it was that I wanted to um, research obscure or fringe topics that made it easy. And that's totally changed now. I find it fascinating and amazing to think that in 40 years, because I have been at the University of Sydney, well, it'll be 41 years in February, um, there are so many subfields that simply didn't really exist. And in some ways this is wonderful. In other ways it produces immense fragmentation across the field and a a lot of um, incomprehension even between scholars as to what one or the other is doing and and why or how it fits together. Yes. Now, I have to interject the question here that comes to my mind. Um, that's a very personal impression that I had lately, but um, I have been a Freemason of 26 years and I, I, otherwise I'm more a solitary worker, but in that field, I can see it very clearly. And I have tested that question on others, not on the podcast, but on other people who are members of groups like O2O, et cetera, et cetera. Well, what is happening at the moment with the COVID situation where lots of those groups are not able to, to, to meet. On the other hand, they are all made up of strong individualists, mainly. Um, so those people have got continue their work and this spreads apart the group because the ritual, the weekly or monthly ritual is not happening. And that's what normally unites those groups again and unites their thinking, their egregore, their, their power, so to speak. Um, do you, do you see a danger for uh, those new religious movements or is that the chance or, um, how would you interpret that that situation? It Im- it impacts different groups differently, obviously, and that's a, a very kind of bland statement. Some groups within the new religious movement kind of frame, um, they live almost communally, and so there are close ties, or there should be close ties of people together in the real world. Um, But solitary practice 
finding communities on the internet which quite often are nowhere near you geographically and particularly in the pagan earth spirituality, neo-shaman kind of subfield of new religious movements, ritual spaces online have been common since the, you know, black screen, green text days of Usenet. Mm. You know, people were doing online ritual well Mm. before there was any graphics interface. And now there are very sophisticated um virtual worlds that people can operate within and encounter each other within. Well, we had just recently an interview with uh, Australian from Tasmania, uh, Morgan, uh, uh, Morgan, Morgan Lee, Lee yeah. exactly. And she had a whole thesis on that subject with virtual reality and ritual. So that's I've an interesting one. But that was the first time I personally had heard about that i'm i felt rather well informed until then but i i discovered that really from now you're mentioning that again is that a, a feature that maybe has come up in australia because the distances uh, and the width of the country is so large or is there something okay. that you see in t- also internationally oh yeah it's it's international but when i'm thinking about back to all of my um obscure, strange, mostly male IT friends from, say, the 80s and the very early 90s, Um, ritual spaces in Usenet groups were a thing and it meant that people could study and also do certain practices with people who were in other countries because maybe your particular country didn't have that. So, for example, the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, um, it's probably a rather controversial thing to say, but apart from a temple in New Zealand, which I believe closed in the around about 1980. 80s, exactly. There hasn't been a legitimate H-O-G-D presence in Australia or New Zealand since. But there are people who teach Australians and New Zealanders online so that you can argue that there is to some extent a golden dawn presence in our country, our countries counting the New Zealanders, even though there is no official body. So I think the online stuff is very useful, but it's not just Australia. I mean, America is full of online communities, particular pagan groups, but also groups that aren't necessarily religious or spiritual or esoteric but can overlap with them. So groups like the Otherkin and the Therianthropy, um, a lot of extreme fandoms where there is, you know, a kind of whole culture developed by participating members, often people don't, you know, they live in some Midwest town and there are two people within 150 miles who care about this stuff. But there's enormous community online. Absolutely. And are you saying, as an answer to my question, that this, as it is now happening with COVID, et cetera, that this could be a new chance for those groups to to regather in that way and develop new forms of ritual and collaboration? I don't, I don't know that it's new. I just think that those groups were actually better equipped to survive a global pandemic than a lot of big religions. And I think that's, a, that's an interesting one because... I co-edit a journal called Fieldwork in Religion and uh, my my co-editor, Rochelle Scott, is at University of Tennessee, Knoxville, and we're quite different. She's a Buddhist study scholar, um, but we get a lot of submissions, you know, and you work your way through them. Some are terrible. You reject them. Some are really great. A lot of them are somewhere in the middle, and particularly because we want to encourage academics who come from non-English speaking, non-Anglophone mm. contexts, often mm. 
there's a lot of work to be done to try to work out exactly what's being argued. But just recently, we've had a massive burst of submissions from Indonesia. And it's it's a fascinating place. And I mean, I love it. I used to you know, it's our n- 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 neighbour to the north. I spent years going to Bali and Java and spending, you know, it's it's just something that you do if you're Australian and you're a bit yeah. non-mainstream. Um, and all of them are arguing that actually Indonesian Islam has reacted to COVID really flexibly and pragmatically and okay. accepted change and online context for those people who are in the cities where there's good internet and, you know, all that kind of stuff and home practice for those places where the online context isn't very good and, you know, the different councils of, of imams and mullahs have been putting out advice to people, how you can do your own prayers at home. And and for one of the classes that I taught this semester, my research assistant and tutor, Ray, found this extraordinary video on YouTube and it was, okay, you're a Christian and you really think taking Holy Communion is important. This guy was a Catholic and it mostly applied to Catholic and I think orthodox ideas. And he said, you can't go to church to receive the Eucharist. I've worked out how you can do it yourself at home. <laughs> and it was okay. amazing. And yeah, so, yeah, you know, yeah. I just think that the, the bigger world religions had to make a more radical change because they were not used to the online context. Sure. They were not used to being marginal. They were not used to having their closest faith companions being hundreds of miles away and only contactable online. Whereas I think a lot of new religions and a lot of esoteric groups were already totally there. Right, right. I'm fascinated by what you're saying about the IT subculture uh, in the 80s that is also much linked to those new religious groups i mean i'm not used to calling them new religious groups but we all know what we what we we talking here about uh, i call them esoteric groups or whatever but um that we are talking about the same stuff of course well religio spiritual esoteric religio spiritual groups um, yeah you know yeah, there's a whole lot. Some of them are institutionalized. Some of them are much more personal and gathered around an Absolutely. individual teacher. You yeah. know? Some of them yeah. are studying a book, you know, like the groups that study the Urantia book online and things like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, which brings me to a question I had on my little list here, um, the, the question of being around one person, let's call him or her a guru, right? Um uh, I had Philip Cargom on here for a few weeks ago, and he, as you were mentioning, Gurdjieff and Uspensky, of course, he was very much at some point, and he he talked about this very openly. So I'm not giving any secret away here. Um, he was very close to Uspensky and his almost his his, his his secretary at some to some extent, and then he suddenly found out, well, this is becoming too much of a guru relationship for me, and he he broke off and. He's, of course, not the only one who that has happened to. So what is your experience now from your point of view, from the academic side with those religious movements that are very centered around a person or where a person takes them and uses them for personal, well, I don't know what I would like to call it, personal um, favors and um, what's your experience with that um, uh, how has that developed over the last decennies and what's your take on it well i find actually um this a really troubling question because again so much of it depends on where your worldview is hmm. And you look at my Facebook page, so you know that most of the politics I post are socialist or anarchist. Yes. Um, I don't even talk about it very much because it's kind of language that doesn't quite work and I think things have changed. But I would describe myself as a militant feminist Mm. and I believe I always have been. Um, 
I have been married. I am heterosexual. I have had relationships with men. I expect parity, equality, partnership. I've not really ever been interested in anything that went in an inegalitarian way. And of course, that's all very well, but it is an ideal. And sometimes things change. For example, my partner of 24 years died in February this year. And in the last two years of his life, he was very, very ill. And a person in that situation cannot be an equal. They require that you change the dynamic of how you you interact, you know. Mm-hmm. So I see that human beings are flexible and able to assume roles and that situations are changing or changeable. So the way that somebody emerges as a leader is a fascinating one. Um, I think you probably know that all the people in new religious movements used to be totally obsessed with this idea of charismatic leaders. Mm -hmm. And I, I guess probably in the last 10 years, there's been a bit of a, a flip on that, partly because a lot of people have kind of come out and said, look, have you actually, you know, met any of these people? Or, you know, did you, have you watched a film of them? And one of the funniest lines, I will not name the colleague in England who said this, but a colleague in England told me once about five years ago, I watched Reverend Moon preach many, many times. He had the charisma of a slug. (laughs) (laughs) Then you think, well, they're not handsome. They're not beautiful. They're not charismatic. They're not alluring. What's going on here? And then it becomes kind of interesting. I think my old-fashioned feminism gets useful here because you start realising that a lot of it's about how power is constructed and then enacted in a community. Mm-hmm. And sometimes what happens is that the charisma of the leader is sort of assumed by the followers who are like projecting onto him or her, rather in the way that when you think you've fallen in love with someone, that person mm-hmm. is dazzlingly attractive and impactful and everything that they say is of interest to you. And once you've fallen out of love with them, you realise that they're very ordinary indeed. And if you walk past them in the street, you wouldn't give them a second look. So, you know, you have to understand that human beings have these excitable, emotional responses. And there's no doubt that people become involved in high demand groups, which most of the big guru based ones are, you know, expect that they can tell you where to live, how much of your money that you have to give the organization, who you can marry, Mm -hmm. what you can eat, et cetera. Um, A lot of people go into those groups when they're, I mean, the old line used to be at a crisis point. But nowadays I think we would water that down again and we'd say like seeking, you know, you're actively looking for something and then this person comes up because your friend has joined or you take a leaflet when you're walking down a busy street or you see an advert for a seminar or a meditation session and you go and then you suddenly think this is what I've been looking for, this is what I need. Mm -hmm. Um, Stuart Wright, who's one of the great sociologists of religion still working, you know, kind of very much full time, and um, he's only a little bit older than me, maybe, I don't know, five or ten years. Um, He's done some really great work, I think, just on leaving groups generally, and mostly he refers to them as religions, and he's mostly talking about new religions, but it would work with esoteric groups. It would work. He says that it it's really always the relationship in the group is emotional and when you leave it's like intimate partner breakdown it's like getting a divorce mm. you lose a world you lose your friends you lose your certainties you you, you experience terrible grief and and all sorts mm. of things but the mm. people the question you asked me specifically was about the guru types who are really, um, what's the right word, 
abusive, coercive, um, perhaps sexually predatory. Um, again, I think this is a really interesting idea. Probably, again, because of the kind of person I am, I, I can't believe well, it would never. Ha- I believe it would never happen to me that no one could ask me to do something that I considered to be humiliating or disempowering, mm-hmm. or you know, etc. But I can see having lots of friends who are very, very different to me that lots of people have quite porous boundaries. I'm a pretty hard boundaries kind of person. Mm -hmm. And um, if you're a porous boundaries kind of person, I think you're a lot more persuadable on all sorts of levels. And there are moments in life when you are more wounded and maybe that that, uh, skin has a hole where somebody can get in. Or... There are moments in life when you're incredibly positive and happy and you see these things through these wonderful rose-colored glasses because the world True. is lovely and good. True, so that's the point. Which is, from a place yeah, no, you're right. You're absolutely right that you must see both sides. Absolutely, absolutely. When you were doing your research, for example, on the Gurdjieff side, you said that you met those people, you had access of course to the books that were publicly available and but at some point not with that group only but with with all groups you might have made research on you come to a point where you might need the the hidden the hidden stuff right when uh, just to give a very blunt example but some some groups would not give you your rituals if they are working in ritual form um, if you're not a member not even to read them um how far could you push your research or have you encountered those barriers often or have you been able to to go beyond for your academic research or how how does that work okay um i think with gurdjieff stuff i've been incredibly fortunate to have met a wonderful group of people And to now have a a network of scholars, I think there's 16 of us in Europe, America, Australia. Um, And we all, like, it it really comes from, from two things. I supervised two PhDs on Gurdjieff topics. The first one was an accident. The student had had some other supervisors and the relationships hadn't gone well And he asked me, was I willing to take it on? It was, I had him for two or three years. I'm not quite sure. Um, It was a very in-depth but very textual, even though he was a member of a group, um, study of the cosmology of Beelzebub's tales. And so I read it again because I'd already owned it because of the books. You, you know, this was I was kind of edging towards forty when he came into my life, so twenty years ago, mm-hmm. and um, I started thinking, "Gee, this is really interesting." And I'd sit with him, and we'd go through the drafts, and I'd say, "But you know, I think you've got that wrong," and he'd be really surprised because he was the one in a group. And I was saying, but but look, I've got this thing and I've put a post-it note on my copy and it says this. And he was going, oh, and then it was kind of like, you know, you get a lot of this stuff. You're not in, but you get it. And then he disappeared. He never, we still work together and I count him in my group of scholars, but he never published his PhD and he stayed with the groups. And I think in a lot of cases he didn't publish the PhD because the groups didn't want him to. Mm. Uh, and then later on, um, He had a mentor, a much more senior Gurdjieff figure in Australia, who's Joseph Aziz, whom I'm sure you've heard of and who is a wonderful, wonderful person and somebody who's become one of the the key kind of intellectual partners that I have, even though um, we have a very formal and, and, and not casual kind of relationship and connection. Uh, And so my second student was also mentored by Joseph and I was drawn much more into knowing him and meeting Mm -hmm. him. And we started talking about the whole secrecy 
what can people be allowed to do? And I mean, I guess I hadn't realised until that second PhD that, and this is this is the real answer to your question. It's it's much easier to be mean now, not just because the academy's changed its ideas and we're no longer just doing Hinduism and Buddhism and Christianity. Mm-hmm. It's easier to be mean now because groups like the most of the Gurdjieff lineages are fragmenting. And the official lines of transmission are ageing. Fewer people are part of them. Many of the archives that have been left that people used to be able to basically restrict access to have been gradually published. Gurdjieff's lectures are available in French and in English. Um, the, the lecture notes written by people like the Women of the Rope from the 1930s and um, and lots and lots and lots of the, the teachers in the lineages, suddenly, because of self-publishing, it's all the internet again, um, yeah, sure. um, even though they've spent most of their lives being, you know, telling everyone that they're not to tell anyone, everyone seems to have at least one book in them before they die. And they start chucking out these memoirs. And most of them are actually not very good. But if you're smart and you already know a lot about kind of the theoretical world of the Gurdjieff work, even before Joseph started publishing the spiritual exercises, I knew what they mostly did. Hmm. Um, it, It wasn't hard. And when we later talked about that, because so much of it has to do with orthodox ideas about theosis, about deification, self-deification. And when I first said that to Joseph, which was years ago, he said, well, you know, I know you've gone a long way from it, but the fact that you were brought up in a strict Catholic family and you have very, you know, good verse, you're well-versed in all of that kind of sacramental ritual form of Christianity, you would pick this up much quicker than a Protestant would. Of course, of course, of course. Yeah, I, I'm sure he's he right is about that. a Catholic yeah. priest. Of course, he is a Maronite. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly, exactly. Yes, I didn't remember that, but you're right. No, no, absolutely. I, I, I think he's he's absolutely right in that. And um, I was going to say that in a different way just now, but but um, in the end, now people are going to hate me for that, but in the end. Most of those religious movements, let's be, let's be careful. Most of them, the final end is always the same. It's the path that is different. And so basically, if you know where it all leads, then it's easier to discover the path they walk, isn't it? In a way, it's, it's very interesting, actually. That, that's, a, you know, that's a standard kind of model, isn't it, that we're all on our particular path and the destination is the same place. Well, in lots the, well of places, that's hermitism, that is hermitism pure, right? Do you know that it's, it's just, it's just being a human being. The destination is always the same. You're going to be dead. Yeah, um, yeah. But, <laughs> you know, so, the, so the idea that, that I live my life every day, it is a path. It is a journey. I yeah. change. I move. And sure. okay, maybe I don't have a spiritual goal. Maybe I do in some ways, who knows? Um, there are so many things that you could put in that space called a spiritual goal, you know. Um, but I think that you must have seen this looking at a lot of the academic publications all across the way in theosophy, in um, anthroposophy, in the Gurdjieff work, in many um, esoteric orders, um masonry there's been so much amazing scholarly work in masonry just recently you know last 10 years maybe mm. Mm. and the, the you the more you know about it the more those connections as you say the the, the destination being the same and and kind yeah. of seeing and also you begin to pick up the connections you start yes. working out who knew who and who read someone else and, you know, where it all kind of crosses over and you think, oh, isn't this interesting? And then you look and with Gurdjieff, you know, because the biography is so unstable, Hmm. one of my hobbies, you know, at some point I'll do something major on it probably after I retire, is I keep trying to use the old sociological goal 
or anthropological goal of triangulation, three individual sources that really can confirm that he was at this place at this time or knew this person and had, you know, some access to these texts. And, you know, these sorts of things are fascinating. I tell my students all the time that what we are most like, really, what scholars, real scholars, you know, in the physical sciences as well, et cetera, we're most like um, forensic criminal investigators. We look mm. for pieces of evidence and we try to build a case, one that yeah. is reliable. And you need a good bit of curiosity and, of course, knowledge and experience for that. And you have to also have, I've got a pretty good memory. It's not perfect, but it's a bit of a file card memory. And if I see something and I know I've seen something like it before, it won't take me long to figure out where I've tucked where, that away. That, that is helpful. Hmm. Um, I mean, I can't, can't just, I can't just draw on it immediately. But I'm one of those sort of obsessive compulsive people who has all my folders very carefully labeled and all the documents in them very carefully labeled. And there's this colossal amount of material I have, but it's not that hard to search. And I can yeah, usually yeah. work out where things are. And I think, oh, yes, I'm right. I did see that before. And then and again, find- there are computers that help you nowadays, right? Well, that's right. They do. They make yeah, the searches. Yeah. Much yeah, easier. Much easier. Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, well, you're publishing a lot, I have to say that here as well, on Academia EDU, um, which is also a very, very great resource to find your work and to, to, to find work about the things that are interesting us here. We have to come slowly to an end. I have a kind of final question for you. Sure. Well, maybe before that, um, we were talking about esotericism, occultism, and the distinction in, uh, earlier. In the, uh, sometimes I believe that uh, the, the term occultism is only uh, a flight from the term uh, esotericism because the word esotericism has been abused so much by all kinds of new agey movements, which in fact, uh, it's everything esoteric. Uh, um, and the the ones who think they are really esoteric rather go for for a new world, a new word, sorry, a new word, occultism. But maybe that's just me. I, I think actually coming again from, you know, a Catholic Christian family, hmm. the occult was bad. Yes. Es- esotericism yes. wasn't yes. bad. Well, not that and bad. And so <laughs> that's like being a new religious movement scholar. Yeah. And flinching all the time when people on television or in popular publications say cult, 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 and you think, no, yeah. for heaven's yeah. sake, you know, yeah. a cult yeah. is yeah. just a group that you don't like. A religion exactly. is a group that you like. Exactly. And that is kind of worse comes to worse, they say, oh, cult has to do with cult. So that, that's even that's even worse. That's even worse. Yeah. Um, so my final question was different. We t- um, I have recently done a, a talk with... I, sure you know him, John Michael Greer, um, on the occult revival of the 19th century and a historical discussion we had on that. And at the end, I asked him the question and I would, I would like to ask you uh, uh, the same question because of, from your point of view, it might be different and, and I'm interested to hear. Um, are we experiencing over the last 30, 40 years, maybe only the last 10 years, are we experiencing again a new occult revival in the way that it happened in the mid 19th century? Or is that just a landscape that has changed and it's the same things that are happening within that landscape? That's a terribly, terribly difficult question. And it goes back to my concern now about the game changer effect of the internet. I mean, almost everything is there. If you need, if you know where to look, almost everything is there. And there's also an argument about, you know, new age, which later people said, oh, we don't like to be called that. So then they were called alternative spiritualities. And then people said, well, alternative to what? And it was like, oh, you know, the mainstream. And then it's like, but these things are mainstream. They're multi-million dollar capitalist in enterprises. You know, <laughs> this is just mainstream. Women's magazines have feng shui columns in them. You know, mm-hmm. nobody thinks anything about how I have – I, I collect ridiculous tarot decks 
I mean, not serious traditional ones. I have a Jane Austen tarot deck, you know. Really? Yes. Yeah. It's the sort of thing that even my mother, seriously Catholic and a big fan of Jane Austen, doesn't really object to. <laughs> <laughs> this is not alternative and it's not weird and it's not out there. And so when I say yeah. I'm attracted to the, the fringes, um, I guess I'm worried all the time in some ways that the fringes are kind of folding back in to the middle all the time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so I don't know if we're undergoing an occult revival. I think there's a lot more people who have a superficial knowledge of a lot more stuff. But basically, you know, straight is the path and narrow is the gate. Um, there's a Bible verse for everything. Serious esotericists? Seriously devout religious people, I think in the Western world, the developed world, the first world, whatever you want to call it, they are fewer and fewer. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I I agree. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, Carol, thank you so much for this lovely talk uh, that we could have. I say this morning because it's morning here. It's late evening in Australia where you are. Thank you for being up with us. Exactly. So I let you go. I let you go. Uh, but I have to say that thank you for help us with your work and with that interview today for help us growing up. And if people look at that Facebook cartoon, they know why I'm saying. <laughs> um, thank okay. you. <laughs> thank you. It was lovely to have you and uh, have a good time down there. I will.
the struggle of the magicians number one and number six so we heard today all together six pieces by george gurdjieff and revised by his scholar and um, friend russian composer thomas de hartman and that was played by charles ketchum pianist recording from the Gurdjieff foundation of california which took place on live on Sunday, September 13. So um, this was our episode 20. And I thank Professor Carol Cossack really very, very much for her time and for being with us here today. It was highly interesting, I believe. And I hope you enjoyed that episode and that interview just as much as I did it when I produced it. So thank you for listening to all of you also. Thank you for being so regular listeners. We really increase our listening figures week by week. It's a great pleasure to produce that podcast. And I, of course, hope that all of you will return next week to next week's episode 21. Well, four more to go before the end of the season, but no worries. Season eight will follow with just one week break afterwards. So no big breaks to expect. Um, but episode 21 next week. And next week, my guest will be, um, well, it will be a bit less occultism and esotericism than you might be used to, even though we are talking about a personality that is really very much um, involved as an artist into that world of the late, late 19th century and I will speak to Thomas Negevin, who has republished a book by Alphonse Mucha, by the famous um, Czech artist who lived in Paris and who has um, inf highly influenced the Art Deco movement. And he has published his book, Le Pater, which is um, uh, artwork uh, accompanying the Lord's Prayer. Um, I don't want to say much more now because um, it might just mislead you. It's a deeply esoteric work that Alphonse Mucha produced there. We're going to talk about that to Thomas Negovin, who has published in a beautiful, beautiful edition that book. More about all that next week. And for today, I wish you a pleasant coming week. Stay healthy, stay safe, and... Take care, stay tuned, hear you soon.